So before we start with chain matching, I wanted to make a few, oh, just one announcement and a few remarks Oops. regarding to what we talked about before. So there was apparently some bug with the loading script for the Jello homework, as you might have noticed. So we decided to give you two, two extra days. So the deadline was not today as it was supposed to be, but will be on Friday instead. <laughs> Uh, Lucy already posted on Piazza, right? Including the face, so that should be fine. Any any questions or? What was the bug? Huh? What was the bug? What I don't remember exactly. Something something with the yeah. parameters loading from the script. It would just load the config file when you first started it. It would only load the config file when you hit reset. Um, so you right. could yeah. load it. it so some people were obviously confused by that, and it was our mistake. So <laughs> we, give you, we give you two extra days for that on work. <laughs> so the deadline is now on Friday at noon instead of today at noon. <laughs> so if you didn't make it today, that's good news for you. <coughs> so uh, last time we talked about position-based dynamics, or PPD. And one thing I'm not sure if I nailed the point home, why is the gauss seidel idea so slow so i just wanted to uh, maybe you can tell me that right so let's let's consider the simple example that i have some some chain attached to just like a 1d structure but it can imagine that it's like very long it's like a long rope or something like that hanging from some frigid object or something like that and let's assume i'm using position-based dynamics that's the technique we talked about on monday to simulate it right so why, what is the problem of the Gauss-Seidel constraint projection uh, step? Imagine I'm moving around this object, it's like some, some sort of bar or something that's, that's movable around, right? So this, that means that this, this vertex here, see me, you see me, yeah you do. This vertex here is rigidly attached to, to my object, right? And this object, these, these other particles, they can, they can move arbitrarily and they are joined using the distance constraints, aka spring. So what is the problem with the gauss seidel type constraint projection? So let me again remind you in case you forgot uh, the idea is to go through every single constraint so here between every two particles I have a constraint there is one there is another one and so on and I project them one by one that's the idea of the gauss seidel constraint projection step okay and I think I mentioned it briefly the last time but I just wanted to make sure it's clear the problem is that this depends on the ordering of the constraints on the order in which they are projected right so let's assume the order is like this, that this goes first, this goes second, this goes third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and this, this is gonna be the last one projected. Is this a good ordering? No, that's, that's, a, that's a terrible ordering, right? Because if I, if I move this somewhere else, then all these constraints are doing nothing, right? Because the moment I move it, then what happens? Then this, this thing stretches like this, but all these other constraints, they are, they are fine. So the, the projection is not doing, not going to do anything, assuming this is already the response length. So this is wasted work, and the only useful work happens here. And then when this happens, then then I get something. Then what happens? Then I project project this spring here. So then what happens is this, right? And then then I go again, right? I do this. Aha! Nothing happened. Aha! Nothing happened. Doof, 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 doof. And finally here something happens, right? So that's really bad. So of course, if you if you ordered it the other way around, if if this one was first, this one second, and so on, then this 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 particular example would work perfectly, right? Until you pulled on the other end, <laughs> of course. So that's that's one of the problems with PBD. The other question, just to make sure you got it, could we do we want to solve all constraints exactly in position-based dynamics? I think I also mentioned it, just it's we don't, right? And why why not? <laughs> what would happen if we did solve all the constraints exactly? What would happen in this case if we solved all the constraints exactly? 
So this is this is this is this is supposed to be something like a rope hanging from something from a hook or whatever. And if we solved all the constraints exactly, how would the simulation look like? Yeah. Exactly, it would look like my pen, right? It would it would just be like trans. It it could like swing, but it would swing like a stick, right? There would be no deformation in the rope whatsoever. So we absolutely don't want to solve all the constraints exactly. Okay, and the shape matching idea, that's what I'm gonna be talking about today, is sort of related to position-based dynamics. It's actually like a predecessor or precursor to position-based dynamics because this paper appeared one year earlier before position-based dynamics. But you can see that some of the ideas are shared. Uh -huh. So let me, let me start as usual by showing you the demo, sort of funny demo. Meshless deformation based on shape matching. So I will explain what, what is meant by meshless in a second. Let's just, let's just see what it will do. <laughs> so the what is this the demoing is unconditional stability. So again, it doesn't really explode easily. Maybe it doesn't explode at all. You know, to be careful with those statements. I believe this is again real time. Everything is real time there. So we will discuss this. These are those are linear deformation modes. This is one part of the quadratic deformation modes. And those are mixed quadratic modes. And this is just putting them all together. So I just give you, want to give you a teaser. It will make more sense after we actually explain what's going on. It's sort of intuitive, right? This is linear deformations applied to the box. So quadratic deformation, so you can see it's not just straight lines, but it's parabolic type curves, and this is rigid. This is what PBD does if you solve all constraints exactly. In the, in the one cluster, that means that shape matching is applied to the entire bar. In two clusters, the bar is basically split in two and shape matching is, is, is done per cluster. And so it's so in the five cluster thing. So the more clusters you have, the more flexible the object will be. It's one extension of to do plasticity. Plasticity is actually so relatively simple. All, all, all plasticity means is that you change the rest pose during the simulation. Uh, <laughs> so this one is not to be sadistic, oh. but to <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it is to be sadistic. <laughs> it's to demonstrate that it's really robust. Try to do this with your Jaloki. <laughs> I mean, not your Jaloki, but this the standard uh, Rongekuta method, right? First, uh, this, this method is uh, ideal for the simple objects like spheres or shoes. And the head was also like the deformations of the head were also very, very simple. Right? So, don't think that the collisions here are resolved perfectly, the things can be penetrating a little bit, but you usually don't notice that. <laughs>
notice also that the rendering is not that pretty. You, you, you know that to make the results look really good, you also want to render it nicely. So that's exactly what they did here. All right. So how does that work? There are actually some pretty interesting ideas. And some interesting mathematics which I would like to explain in detail today. But let's start with the motivation. So position-based dynamics, which we discussed uh, on Monday, it's usually used for thin shells or cloth for two-dimensional objects living in 3D. And it's because if you want to do volumetric objects, then mass springs or the equivalent in PPD distance constraints are not ideal. It's possible to do it. That's exactly what you are doing or have already done with Jello. But you might have noticed that you cannot really do things like Poisson ratio or Poisson effect. Some, someone asked me about that. What is, what is Poisson effect? That means that if I have something like a, a box or a duck and I apply force to it, then what it, what it should do, it should, it should squish and stretch, right? The, the material should probably preserve volume. Most materialists behave like that. It shouldn't, shouldn't just, if I squish a box, it shouldn't just do this, right? It shouldn't just like get smaller. <laughs> Usually materials just bulge out. And that's really not easy to do with mass spring systems or with distance constraints and position-based dynamics. So the right solution, if you want to get talk to guys from mechanical engineering and ap applied mechanics, they will tell you, well, then you need to go to do continuum mechanics and finite element method. They have whole, whole, whole courses about that. I will also cover a little bit of that later in this course because it's good to know this. But the mathematics there is a little bit more complicated and also you need to do all the standard time integration things. You, you again have the choice between explicit time integration, which is simple but not robust, explodey, or the slower implicit time integration, which requires the second order derivatives, the Hessians, and solving linear systems. So there's like no single great choice, right? Ch pick your poison. <laughs> Nevertheless, if you are doing like computing or computing something where accuracy matters, you would go for the finite element method. In a physics-based animation, the shape matching is very nice because that basically off offers the opposite set of trade-offs. It's, it's fast as si and simple, but it's not very principled. So you, would, you wouldn't want to use it to simulate something where accuracy matters, but if it's something like, like ducks or if it's just for like fun applications like games or even for films where you have artists in the loop which like tweaking parameters and make it look right, then, then this is very useful. And it's not just limited to physics-based animation applications, like the obvious things like bouncy, bouncy eh, animals and things. I have also seen it used, for example, for image registration. So. so what does it mean? What does the meshless buzzword? I don't know if you have encountered the, some meshless things before. This is what the title of the paper says. Right? Meshless deformations based on shape matching. So do you have an idea what meshless means? Well, there's no mesh, right? So what is there? <laughs> there's just points. And the points, they don't have to be explicitly connected with anything. Just like I draw here the rope to begin with, right? That's the point, the, the rope, there were some particles or points connected with some springs or some constraints. So in these meshless methods, there is no, at least no explicit connectivity, which is, which simplifies things quite a bit. You had to deal with it in your Jello, right? How things are connected together. It requires some data structures, requires some reasoning, how to connect the things together. Then you need to traverse it. So meshless methods are easier because they don't really need, uh, they don't require you to maintain, set up, connectivity at all. And this is also not just used in physics-based simulation, especially a couple of years ago, uh, point-based rendering was very popular. I don't know, is it still popular today? Not so much, I think. The idea was basically forego triangles. <coughs> Let's just render points. The GPUs are so fast that you can just render lots of points. And if you have enough points to cover all your pixels, 
And you don't really need any triangles between them, right? <laughs> so this is uh, an interesting way to think about physics-based animation. That's one of the reasons I wanted to cover this technique. But it's also a very, very nice and very useful technique, so even if it was not meshless. So if it's not, if there is no mesh, uh, what what do we do about internal forces? That's you, you should uh, sort of have the intuition by now that the main problem there is how to deal with internal forces, right? That's 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 the difficult nonlinear part. The things like gravity, that's pretty simple, or inertia, those things are fairly simple. The internal forces are usually the troublemakers, the nonlinear components there, right? So in 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 this uh, paper, the meshless deformation based on shape matching, the idea is shape matching. So let me first try to draw it before I will show you the slide. So let's assume that my object is like really simple. It's, it only has four points. And this is the rest pose of my object. So my object is just points. There is no, no connection between them. It should be enticing too because it will be easier to code, right? And Let's say I'm simulating it, simulating it subject to some forces. And so this was like vertex one. I don't know, let me make it compatible with the slide. One, two, three, four. And let's say that the vertex one during my simulation went to one prime, vertex two went to some two prime position, vertex three went to some three prime position, vertex four went here. So this is where I started. This is my rest pose of my, of my object. And I'm simulating it and currently I'm at this state. So clearly the shape is not the same as, as, it, as, as it was in the rest pose, right? So the idea, and this is the key idea of shape matching, this is what we'll spend most time deriving today, is to find an optimal translation and rotation of the rest pose shape such that after applying that translation and rotation, these translated and rotated points will match the current state as closely as possible. So let me say that again, because that's, that's, that's the key here. What I'm looking for, this is my rest pose. This is my current pose. I'm currently simulating. The things are floating around, right? Like, like the shoes and faces and whatnot are floating around. And currently they are in something that it can be anything, right? So let's say it looks like this at the current frame. And what I need to do, I need to find a translation and rotation of these points such that they get as close as possible to the currently deformed points. So here, what, what would I do? Where, where do you think it would go? I think it would go to something roughly like this, right? So this would, this would be my point one, I don't know, under bar, two, three, and four. So notice that these underbar things, I could uh, I could like conceptually connect it if this is some box I'm, it's not really connected because it's all meshless, but let me just for the purpose of illustration connect it. All I want to show here is that this is a rigid transformation of this object here, okay? So this is called Procrustes problem. Here is a, a slide which draws it a little bit nicer. If you wonder why Procrustes, then, then Google Procrustes from Greek mythology and you will find <laughs> the reason. <laughs> Nevertheless, that doesn't matter the name. What matters is that we have some source point. So x, uh, these zeros means it's in the rest pose, the undeformed pose. And these axes, these, these, uh, these, uh, these y axis, these are the current deformed configuration and I'm looking for an optimal translation T and rotation R applied to the rest pose, such that after I apply it, then these distances, the G1 and X1, the G2 and X2, G3 and X3, G4 and X, G4 and X4, they are as close as possible. So in case my current deformation was just a rigid body transformation, I should find the exact rigid body transformation by this by this process by this procrustes by solving the procrustes problem and that's that's the key idea of this uh, algorithm that's basically really the main trick there 
because after we have computed this, and that's what we'll spend most time uh, deriving, how to compute how to compute this optimal TNR. After we have computed it, then we have computed also the G's, right? And after we have computed the G's, then we say that we basically emulate the internal forces by saying that the current position, current deformed position of my particles are attracted to the G's. So this being attracted, uh, that's basically like we set up like something like a force. And that basically emulates the fact that this is some elastic material which wants to maintain its shape. Okay, got it? So it's sort of departing from the traditional idea that I have some, that I discretize my material into some small pieces and then I formulate some energy on every single piece. This is looking at the entire object as a whole transforming, finding finding the globally optimal translation and rotation of the object against the current state, and then saying, okay, well, we don't want to go too far from just the rigid transformation of that object, like from the rigid body modes. The rigid body modes mean no deformation of the, of the object, so this really approximates internal forces. That's, that's the idea of shape matching. Okay, is that clear? If that is clear, then what we need to do now is to solve the Procrustes problem. And this problem, by the way, is um, useful not just in shape matching, it's, it's useful in many other applications, like in geometric processing, for example. Question, yeah? Sorry, but forces. External. The external forces they will still be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will, I will write, I will write the integration formulas later. And external forces, of course, still act on it. And inertia is also still part, part, play, part of the game. It has to be. But those, those, those things are standard. Uh, what is, what is hard are the internal forces, and this shape matching is used only for the internal yeah, forces. How, how or, What pushes it? Okay, I can, I can show you the integration formulas already if you want. Maybe. Oh, it's 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 a good question. Maybe I should have uh, ordered it in a different way so I can. Okay, we still need to solve the Procrustes problem, but we can solve it in a little bit. So let me explain you how exactly the time stepping works. So let's assume we have already solved for the optimal rotation R. The, those are centers of centers of masses. Well, you know what, Disre disre disregard this. Just assume that we have computed the goal positions G. And then we are going to do this, this type of time stepping, this type of integration. So we use the goal positions in the velocity update formula. So that basically really means that this is just a force, right? Just like here, we have external forces, right? This term, this term that, that's basically inertial term, right? That we are just updating the previous velocity. So this is the previous velocity, this is inertia, this is external force, gravity or collisions or whatever. And th these are the shape matching forces. Those are the maintain the shape forces. That it's sort of, th this, this is what it's saying, it could wiggle around the rest pose, but not too much. And it's, and it's done by saying that the Previous positions, xi, they should get close to the gi, the rigidly transformed rest pose positions. Okay? And the integration on the positions is just just a standard Euler step. So I will come back to that later. I want to first explain. Is that does that answer your question? Okay, cool. So that's really not that difficult. It's yeah, it's good to clarify that, but after we, after we have solved the Procrustes problem, that will be easy. So the key thing there is to do this. So what does it, what does it mean geometrically? Geometrically, it means that I have a bunch of points. They don't really have to form a cube or anything. They can be like 
absolutely arbitrary points. And they describe my rest pose somehow, right? If it was Jello, you could just generate points wherever or particles wherever, wherever you are currently generating them. If you have a mesh, then you could somehow sample it with points also volumetrically. Doesn't matter here. Here I have just an arbitrary cloud of points and they are called x10, x20, x30, and so on. Those are these xi zeros. So the zero means in the rest pose undeformed pose, okay? And now I have the current state where the system currently is. So that can be, again, another completely arbitrary cloud of points, except that I, I know I have a correspondence. Yeah? So I have x, x1, x2, and x3. So I know that this x1, 0 corresponds to this x1. I, I do know that. I also know, of course, that there is the same number of them. So there's endpoints at the beginning and endpoints at the end. Yeah? So how, how do we know the position of uh, points in current state? So that's, that's my... So I don't know it in the current state. I know it in the previous step, right? And yeah. from the previous step I started, I started somewhere. I started here, right? <laughs> So this, this, this already means, yeah, I know, I know it's a little bit confusing. I sort of, I'm sort of explaining arbitrary that I, I assume that I am at some point in the simulation, right? That assume that I already have the simulator working, I, it's already running, oh, okay. and at some time I just stop it and look at the current state, and this is the current state, oh. okay? Like the, the, the way you initialize it, you, you would, the, the way you would initialize it, the way you would start it, is that you would say that these x's are equivalent to these x zeros that it starts at the rest rest pose, for example, right? Then of course the, the solution is trivial, right? But then something starts acting on the system. Gravity starts acting on the system. External forces start acting on the system. So the system is st starts to evolve, right? So they, they won't be the same as, as the initial ones. It's really the same like you have in your Jello thing, right? If if, if you just at any time, any frame, you have some current configuration. So this is what I'm referring to here. That's that's the current configuration. So this, this is uh, uh, in current uh, state. It's it's not because uh, uh, internal force and uh, the, the external force move the point there. But no, this is how I compute the the internal forces. So basically, you can forget about all forces. You can even forget about time integration. When I'm talking about Procrustes problem, it's really just about aligning two point clouds together. That's, that's all I care about when solving Procrustes problem. So let, let, me, let me state the problem without any connections to any physics. That's exactly why it's also important in, in many other areas. I think it's also used in vision some and so on. So the problem is that if I have a source point cloud and target point cloud, I want to register them as closely as possible. I, I have the correspondences. I know that this point here corresponds to this point here. I know that this point here corresponds to that point over there, that this point here corresponds to this point here, and so on. There is the same number of points in, in both sets. And my task is to find a translation and rotation such that after applying the translation and rotation to the source point cloud, I get as close as possible to the target one. Okay? I think this question is, uh, because in our general simulation, uh -huh. we calculate the force and uh, the final force, and we, we estimate the next best the position to that. But for this, uh, for, for this question, I, I think we are to preserve the shape. It's a little different, right? Which we don't estimate. Uh, I mean, uh, well, okay. In, in standard standard physics, so thanks for the discussion. It's always nice to okay. be in, be interactive. So in standard physics based simulation, you would also have like some arbitrary shape, right? Something would get squished somehow, and then the next step would be to compute the elastic restorative forces, right? If I squish something, then the material resists the deformation by forces, right? That's that's how continuum mechanics sort of starts, right? If I have 
some squishes something and I squish it, then the bacteria doesn't like it. <laughs> and, ex and, and there are forces acting, internal forces acting against this squish, right? So that would be that would be the, the classical physical classical continuum mechanics viewpoint, and here it's basically the same idea, except that we bypass the internal forces. That all we do is we just solve the Procrustes problem, and we basically say we do something like internal forces. Okay. Maybe maybe it will help if I just mention that when we will be talking about continuum mechanics, which will be we will be later, then the key uh, or an, another way you can be looking at it is in terms of deformation energy. Instead of computing forces, you could be computing deformation energy, and you have already dealt with the deformation energy for a single spray, right? This, this energy function from Hooke's law that was a an example of a deformation energy function. Now you can have a deformation energy function for arbitrary objects, for, for anything, and it's just an energy, it's, it's a function which for any deformation of the object, so let's say I stretched it or something, it gives me a scalar which tells me how much deformed that thing is, okay? So in all these of all these ideas, the shape matching, standard continuum mechanics, they have in common this, this thing that they basically just measure how badly deformed the current state is, or any, it doesn't matter if it's current state, any state, right? I just give it the deformation and it tells me, is it really bad deformation? Is it mediocre deformation? Is it no deformation? Is it just rigid body transformation? Does that make sense? Okay, maybe. Oh, uh, maybe it will be clearer after we have finished this 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 discussion. So let's take a look now at the Procrustes problem, where where I don't really care where these point clouds came from. All all I care about is that they have the same number of points. So I am given as input the x i zeros where i goes from one to n, and the x i's where i also goes from one to n. I don't have to care where they came, came from at all. I have some weights here. Maybe I could just put their masses because in shape matching, all we deal with is, is masses, MIs, so that you don't confuse it. Let's just do masses, MI, and they are, of course, non-negative scalars, probably strictly greater than zero. Yeah, so you don't confuse the W's from PPD, which was actually inverted masses. So forget it about uh, forget about the W's. Let's just say that they, these are weighted by masses. And in this formulation, I'm actually looking for two vectors, not just for one, but for two. That's that's how the original shape matching was formulated. So let's just do it the same way. So the T zero is a translation vector it's more like a point really in somewhere in the rest pose so here is a t0 and here is a t that's that's in the sort of deformed pose i hope that's not confusing so if these are two you know what let me put their points they should really be points the point being that if i subtract two points i get a vector so if i do x10 minus t0 i get this vector in the same way, if I do x1 minus t, of course, this, this could be also written as minus xi minus t, right, this piece. So that basically means that I rotate this vector and I want to get close to this vector. I could also improve it by putting there the norm notation because obviously this is a 3D vector and I'm taking its square norm. So the task is for given xi zeros and xi's, compute t0 and t, which are points from R3, and a rotation matrix R, which from SO3. Hope you are familiar with this notation. This means a special orthogonal group in three dimensions. That means that the matrix R is orthonormal and has determinant one. Everybody, I hope, understands that. All right, so let's see how do we solve it. 
Do you have an idea? Or did you see it somewhere else? Procrastinate problem. Well, that's good. I will not be wasting your time. So the first step is to find the T0 and T. So all this is, is basically just a minimization problem, right? We are given the axis and these, these are the unknowns. R is unknown, T, uh, T0 is unknown, and, uh, and T is unknown. Well, to solve a minimization problem, we will have to do a little exercise in differentiation. Right, I mean, the paper doesn't really do a very good job in explaining it. It just throws the final formulas at you and doesn't really tell you where did they come from. So I would really like to explain you where do they come from. So let's try to do the differentiation here. So let's call this function, for example, phi. It doesn't really matter. And it's a function of t0, t, and r. And I will just write it down again. So this is sum over i, i. And here I have r times xi0 minus t0 plus t minus xi. So I just copied the formula from the slide. quickly as possible to do it as quickly as possible I think the fastest way is to just say so just rem remind the well, so what, what do we need to do if we need to compute the gradient of 5 with respect to t0 and the gradient of 5 with respect to t we are we will see that they are actually very closely related right so you should remember from Tintin's lecture that if I have a function, if I have vector functions f and g, this is just reminding you the multivariate differentiation rule, and I define a function h which is f transpose g, where h would be from Rn to R1. Then to compute the gradient of h, what do I do? I take the value ft, multiply it with the Jacobian of g, then take g transpose and multiply it by the Jacobian of f. So let me give it dimensions, that should make it more sense. So this is the gradient, one by n vector. This is one by m. The Jacobian of G is M by N, which must be, otherwise it would not work. The G is also one by M, and the Jacobian of F is, again, M by N matrix, okay? So uh, we, will, we will need to apply this to this expression. So if I say that in my, in my case, this F is R, or it's actually the sum. Right. Well, I do that. well, let's just say it's this. Just say the function is defined like this. Then what I have here is FTF, right? That's that's the same as the square norm of F, right? So in the case that in, in this in this particular case the f and g are the same. So in this case the formula for differentiating the square norm of f will be just two times f transpose the differential of f. Okay. So let me apply to this formula. So let's first do the gradient by t0, phi. So I take this formula and apply this rule. So I will get two and sum over all mi's. 
so here here I will have to do what done So here I should take this thing transposed, right? So I should do R x i zero minus t zero plus t minus x i transposed, and now times the Jacobian of this thing. So what is the Jacobian when if I'm differentiating with respect to t zero? So this is the function I'm looking at, right? It's a function function of t zero and t. That's I assume that the R is constant. If I'm differentiating it only with respect to T0, then I assume that all the other guys are constant. And the F is, in, in my case, it's a function from R3 to R3, right? I give it, if I only differentiate with respect to T0, I give it a T0 and it produces me a different vector, right? So what is the Jacobian here? Anybody has an idea? Well, that this is this is the only variable there is t zero, right? And so it's it's really it's linear with respect to t zero. So the Jacobian is just minus r. The one thing I forgot here is that this all needs to be transposed because this uh, would give me just a one by n vector. I want an n by one vector, so I'll transpose this entire thing. And I will get two some uh, m i, and we'll get. Oh, let me put the minus here, and this will be r transpose times this times r x i zero minus t zero plus t minus x i. Okay. So if I do the same thing to differentiate with respect to t, it's going to be really similar. So again, should I, I will put the transposition there already. So what is going to happen? So now I'm differentiating this with respect to t. So what, what is going to be the Jacobian? Just identity, right? So that means I will get simply this. I will get only R x i zero minus t zero plus t minus x i. Yeah, that looks correct. So now I have computed the gradients. And to compute the minimum, I need to set the gradients to zero, right? So I will take the gradient of five with respect to t zero and say that this is equal to zero. And I'll take the gradient of five with respect to t and I'll also say that this is zero. So that, that means that, mean that this factor of minus two is not relevant there, it does not matter. So let me take the first formula and set it, this one, and set it to zero. So what happens there? This RTR will cancel, right? Because RTR, remember that R is a rotation, so RTR is going to be identity, which is sort of nice. So if I, so this, this equation, uh, I can write, if I plug in this, I can write it like this. So this is going to be sum over mi, xi zero minus t zero, and it has to be equal to sum of mi times xi minus t. Uh, where did I make a mistake? I made a mistake here. Okay, and that's summing over i, summing over all, all, the, all the points there. 
Did I, is that, is that correct? I think it is correct. So this is not just one equation, right? This is a system of three equations because these things are vectors, xi0, t0, xit are vectors. The m's are just scalars, those are my masses, and r is a matrix, just an arbitrary matrix. I don't know what it is, but it turns out it doesn't really matter. So what if I look at the gradient with respect to t, what will that give me? That will give me this. So I can put the rotation here and I will get mi xi0 minus t0 equals sum over i mi xi minus t. I'm putting it on the other side of the on other hand of the equation so I multiply it by minus. I hope that's not confusing. If anything is confusing, just yell at me. Or or wrong. I sometimes make mistakes. So this is another set of three equations. It turns out that these, the first three equations and the last three equations, they are actually not very different. They are actually just a linear combination of each other. Which if you think about it, that makes sense, right? So what, what I mean by this, I mean that if I multiply this thing, if I left multiply this, by r, then I get exactly this, right? So here I have three equations. These are some three, here I have another three equations, but it turns out that the two sets of equations are actually linearly dependent. So I, I only really need to pick one and solve one of them. If you think about it, it really makes sense, right? Or <laughs> in other words, it doesn't make sense to be solving for both t0 and t because the translation, uh, because of what? Uh, because t0 and t, that, that would be six degrees of freedom, right? There's another three degrees of freedom in, in the R. But then the translation only defines three degrees of freedom. So let's pick one of the sets of equations and solve it. So maybe maybe this one will be easier with the, there is not the R, R trans. It doesn't really matter, they are really so similar. So let me try to rewrite it. So let's let's take this this one and rewrite it. So I will get R times sum mi xi zero minus sum mi t zero. So this, uh, the, the t zero is constant, right? So this, this sum becomes an independent sum. And this, this is equal to sum over i m i x i minus sum of m i times t. So let me put this all, let me rearrange this a little bit. So I can put this on the right hand side of the equation and the x terms on the left hand side of the equation. So let's try that, so I will do i x i zero minus sum of m i x i that will be equal to r times sum of m i t zero minus the sum of m i times t this is also like like that So because those are just some some of the masses, you could you could you could just interpret this as the total mass of the system. 
then I can just divide by this, right? And what I will get if I divide by that, I will get, let me put this on the left hand side in the interest of space. So this will give me RT zero minus T equals R times I X I zero divided by sum of M I minus sum of I X I divided by sum of M I. Did I do it right? I think so. Yeah, that looks right, huh? Is that clear? Okay, good. So from this, we can see that so first of all, it's not unique. How do I pick the T0 and T, right? T0 and T, they, they have six degrees of freedom total. T0 has three, T has three. But here I have only three equality, equality constraints. So I still have three degrees of freedom left, right? Nevertheless, an obvious choice presents itself here, right? If I just say that this is T0, and if I just say that this is T, then I'm done because then obviously this, this equation is satisfied, right? Because I get RT0 minus T on the left-hand side and RT0 minus T on the right-hand side. So basically this means that I define T0 to be this and define T to be that. Now the nice thing about this is that the T0 and T does not depend on the R at all. And furthermore, it has a very intuitive physical interpretation, right? Because what is this T0 here, the way I just defined it here? Right, exactly, the gravity point or the center of mass of the rest pose points, right? And the T is the same thing, the center of mass of the current points, or my points I'm asking about. So uh, this basically shows me that if I'm looking for the optimal T0 and T, then I have multiple choices, but one of the choices, the choice that probably makes the most sense is that I just pick the, the centers of centers of masses, and this is what is uh, this, the, the result is summarized on this slide here. So this x zero cm that means the center of mass, and it's exactly the expression I have just derived there. And, and as I said, it's it's a derived by taking the derivative with respect to t zero and t. It really just only one of them matters because the other one is just a linear combination of the other one. And the x center of mass is the center of mass of, of those axes. So in this picture I was drawing here, and I have some cloud of, oh, okay, let me draw another picture to make it more clear. So if I have some cloud of points, another cloud of points, the first step is that I compute their center of mass. This is the x0 cn, this is the x cn. And now the rest, uh, the remaining part of the Procrustes problem uh, consists in aligning these vectors. So from the center of mass, after I subtract the center of mass from all my points, I need to align the resulting vectors. So I can denote these resulting vectors as QIs for the rest post vectors. So those guys would be QIs and PIs for the deformed pose. So those are the points after I subtract the center of mass. And the last part of solving the Procrustes problem consists of finding the optimal rotation which best aligns the Q's and P's. So we start by solving a little bit simple problem, a relaxed problem by finding an arbitrary three by three matrix A. So here A is just a three by three matrix, doesn't have to necessarily be a rotation. And we, define, we want to find the A such that this expression is minimized. So it's again solving a minimization problem. Is that, is, is, is that clear? Any question? Any confusion? So it's again an, op uh, an optimization problem. I want to find the minimum of this function where I'm where 
I'm allowed to optimize over the matrices A. A is an arbitrary matrix, and I need to find it such a matrix which gives me a minimum in this expression. Okay? So the idea is again the same. I differentiate and set the gradient with respect to A to 0. The tricky piece here is that now I am differentiating with respect to a matrix which is something that uh, we did not cover at the beginning of the course because it gets a little bit trickier because if you are differentiating with respect to a matrix then it's then you get something more than vector function you get a tensor function and you need to deal with tensors it's not the end of the world it's possible but i prefer to avoid it and fortunately you can avoid it uh, by writing everything in matrix notation. So let me mm, show you how we can differentiate it without using any funny tensors. So let me denote the function as psi. It's a function of a matrix A. So here is a matrix. And it's this. So I'm just copying the formula from the slides here. Okay. And here the unknown is a matrix. So I don't like to be dealing with a matrix. So um, the trick here is to use a vectorization operation. So vectorization of a matrix gives me a vector, which if this was a 3 by 3 matrix, then the vector is going to be a 9 by 1 matrix. And it's basically just the columns of the matrix stacked one by one. So this is called the vectorization operation. Now the vectorization operator has an interesting property in that if I have two matrices A and B, it can be arbitrary, it doesn't have to be this A, it can be arbitrary A and B. Then there is this uh, formula for vectorization of the product of matrices. This is a product of matrices. This turns out to be equivalent to this. This is, the, this is the key formula there. This is essentially how do we encode tensors in matrices. So we never have to really learn anything about tensors. We only need to deal with matrices. And the only things we need here is the vectorization operation and Kronecker product. That's the Kronecker product I talked about before. I don't really have time to um, remind that again, so I hope you remember that. And this is the key property here, which we will use. So where are we going to use it? So here I'm computing A times QI, right? So a times qi is a three by one vector. So that's equivalent to its vectorization, right? If, if that thing already is a vector, then vectorizing it just gives me the same thing. And now using this formula, what, what will I get by using this formula? So the a is a and the qi plays the role of b in this general formula. So here I will get qi transpose Kronecker a three by three identity times vectorized a, right? Which I just call lowercase a because it's now a vector. So what are the types here? The qi transpose here is a one by three vector. This is a three by three matrix. So this total thing is a three by nine matrix and the a is a nine by one vector. So this thing still is a three by one vector, which is good because the types, types do match not a syntax error. So let me take this and plug in this, the, the expression there. So what do I get? I get mi. Let me see if I can make it quick. Well, so this is, of course, aqi minus pi transpose aqi minus pi, right? which is, so I will plug in there now this expression. So this is my QI transpose times Kronecker identity times A minus PI 
transpose. Do, do, do. The same thing, QI transpose, Kronecker identity times A minus PI. Now I have to expand the product. So what this will give me is this. They try to write it neatly, so I will get A transpose, then I will have to transpose this entire thing, so this is QI transpose Kronecker identity transposed times QI transpose Kronecker identity A, that's the quadratic term, those are these two terms together. Then I have minus PI transpose QI transpose Kronecker identity. Maybe I should have given it to you for homework, then I would have to do it myself, but that's okay. And then I have this. Then I have minus uh, A transpose QI transpose Kronecker identity transpose times PI plus that's the easy part, PI transpose PI. All right. Hope I didn't make too many mistakes. So the first thing is that this is a one by one matrix, so I can transpose it and I get the same thing. So this is equivalent to AT Q, I, T, Kronecker, I, transpose, P, I, which is exactly the same thing as here. So I have, I have just this twice there, right? Let me see, that's the form I want there. So I can just, so these two guys are the same guys, so I can just put their minus to this. All right? So let's take a look at the now let's take a look at the first term here. That's 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 this thing here. So let me simplify this a little bit. So A transpose Q I transpose Kronecker identity transpose Q I transpose Kronecker identity A. How can I simplify this? So first of all, there is a uh, formula for the Kronecker product obeys this rule. If I transpose the Kronecker product, I can also write it like this. The other uh, property of Kronecker products which we will need is this. C Kronecker D, that's equivalent to AC Kronecker BD. That's another fact, purely algebraic thing. So if I apply this first property there, I get this. I just get rid of the transpose here. This is identity matrix, so transposing it does nothing, right? Okay. And here I apply the second property, so this will be equivalent to. to, to do. QI, QI transpose, Kronecker identity with identity is of course identity. All right, and what is this? This is a three by one vector, this is one by three vectors, so this is a, just a three by three matrix. This is, all of them are just the three by three identities. So it still works. Is that clear? I, I just apply these Kronecker product rules there to simplify whatever I have in there. Now, why was why I was getting it in this form is that now I can easily differentiate it. So let me compute the gradient of psi with respect to the lowercase a. So I take this expression and I compute the gradient with respect to a. Now that's simple, right? Because now a is no matrix, now a is just a vector. So computing the gradient is easy. So I will 
use the simplified form of this term here. So this is going to be just two sum of mi times qi qi transpose Kronecker i3 times a. That's because this matrix obviously is symmetric, right? So I don't have to play the a plus at game. I can just put, put this there twice. that correct yeah I think so and this thing here here the AT simply disappears and I will just get that this is minus 2 sum over mi with summing over i of course this thing was transposed so if I can apply the transposition rule I get qi Kronecker identity times pi. So that's that's the that's the gradient. So that's basically differentiating this expression with respect to all elements of the matrix. And so that this is manageable, I had I have vectorized the matrix to turn it into a vector. And this is the expression I got. So from here, we are almost done. The one thing we need to uh, we need to now, we, we now need to put it back to matrices, essentially revert back from this. So here I will again apply this property of factorization. So this will. So the Q plays the role of B here. So this is equivalent to vectorizing PIQI transpose, right? Because that's exa exa exactly this formula where the QI plays the role of B transpose. So the QI transpose I put here. And this PI, that's just vectorized PI, it's a vector already, so there's nothing to vectorize, it's the same thing. That plays the role of A. Okay. Now this thing I can also simplify a little bit. I can say that this is the this is sum of mi qi qi transpose Kronecker i3. This is this is just a three by three matrix. So I can call this matrix AQQ just as a matter, just to simplify the notation. And then notice that this A, the A is just vectorized A, right? That's, that's how I defined A. So if I now write the gradient of psi equals zero, and let me apply all these simplifications here. And I will get I will also get rid of the two because when I set it to zero, that of course does not matter. So I will get that AQQ Kronecker I3 vectorized A, where A is my unknown. And when I set it to uh, zero, then this thing goes on the right hand side. So that, that has to be equal to the sum of MI, and here is my vectorized PIQI transpose. So I can simplify this front ha right hand side as follows. I can just say, I can just put it inside the vectorization thing, right, and put the mi, pi, qi, t here. And then I can call this matrix, that's also a 3 by 3 matrix, and I can call it apq. So both aqq and apq are 3 by 3 matrices. And we are almost there. Almost there. Aha, uh -huh, here I think I need to apply this property again. Right, right, right. So here I will apply this again. So this is equivalent to 
this left hand side is equivalent to what I mean. so this is a vec of what so the B is get transposed so this is a a q q right a a q q transpose but the transpose doesn't matter because the EQQ is a symmetric matrix, so that's the same thing as A, AQQ, right? So all together, okay, I need another paper. Maybe I can do this. So all to, oh, maybe I can do this. Oh, that's cool. So what I, have, what I have ended up with is the vec of A, A, Q, Q equals the vec of A, P, Q. But then I can as well get rid of the vectorization. And so this is equivalent to saying that A, A, Q, Q is equivalent to A, P, Q. And all, all these guys are just three by three matrices. So assuming that AQQ is invertible, which it usually is, unless you have some weird configurations like all the points on, on, on the line or something like that, then, so AQQ invertible. Then we can say that that basically is equivalent to saying that A is APQ, AQQ inverse. That's 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 the solution of the uh, optimal linear transformation. Where do I have that? Here. So after computing the derivatives with respect to a matrix, which is a little little, little, little bit tedious, but never nevertheless it's manageable even without going to tensors. And I am missing an inverse here. So this is the matrix APQ. This is my matrix AQQ. And this is the solution. Now, this is just the optimal inner transformation. So if I want to find the optimal rotation, what do, what do I need to do? I need to find the rotation R, so that R is a rotation, R is from SO3, such that the, the difference between A and R for Abelian's number square n is minimized, right? So do you know what is the solution? What is the rotation? What is the, how do I get the R matrix? I think that then explained it in one of the first classes, right? What is the buzzword there? I do it at polar decomposition or single value decomposition. That's how I, for an arbitrary matrix, I get the best fit rotation matrix. There's one detail that has to do with single value decomposition and proper rotation, but uh, th that detail we will cover later. So for now, the R, we just get, we just do polar decomposition, which says that I, A equals RS, and this R term, which is in SO3, and the S is a symmetric matrix, symmetric. The R is the best fit rotation. So that's the rotation which we will use in shape matching. So that's, that's how it's done. So the derivation was a little bit ugly, but at the end of the day, all we need to do is compute the APQ, AQQ, invert, the AQQ, by the way, is constant because it only depends on the rest pose. So you, you only need to invert it once. But the, the polar decomposition needs to be computed every frame. And once we have done that, then we are basically done because once we have the R, And the T, the T's are hidden here in the centers of masses. That's, that's, that's why the T's don't explicitly appear there. The, the T's basically are the centers of masses. 
So we can directly compute the goal positions. The goal positions is where the rigid, where, where the object would go if it was rigid, right? And then we do this time stepping, which I, which I already explained a little bit, which says that th there is this special force which pushes the particles to their positions where it, where it would go if the object was rigid. It's not perfectly rigid, of course, because the, the other, the inertia term and the external forces term, they are competing with it. So it's not perfectly rigid. That's why it can like wiggle and jiggle and, and whatever. And there is a parameter to control that. So if I set the alpha to one, then it means that I want it to be as rigid as possible, modulo the external forces. And alpha means zero, that there will be no internal forces, that it, it can, that the points can go to whatever they want. In that case, it probably will not look very nice, right? But uh, you can still do that. And there are some extensions. There are these extensions to, to the linear modes and quadratic modes. Here are the linear modes. There is nine of them. I don't have a whole lot of time to uh, discuss about it. Why there is nine of them? because it's a three by three matrix, right? So there's nine elements. So there is nine linear modes. And you can also extend it to the quadratic modes. So both the linear and quadratic, they would, they would have 27 degrees of freedom. It would be three by nine because the quadratic function in 3D gets nine degrees of freedom. And it, there is one set for every coordinate for x, y, z. So it goes to a total of 27. So there is nine of the linear modes plus nine of the pure quadratic modes and nine of the mixed quadratic modes. And that is, that is shape matching. There are some other extensions and generalizations that you can do it you don't have to do it the whole object as a, as a whole. I think that's what the demo was mostly doing, like all these ducks and shoes and speeders. They were like very simple objects, so you just apply the shape matching on the object as a whole. But of course, you don't have to apply it on the entire object. You can just apply it on the, on the individual clusters. And there is uh, also a follow-up paper called Fast LSM, which is essentially still the same idea, except that now there is a fast summation formula applied the clusters so that you don't have to compute for every cluster or all the particles but you can reuse the computations you have done before so this is basically an extension of that idea all right any questions okay so if not then we will call this shape matching <laughs> thank you